right on right on we have a uh, ross backstage with us here um so uh let's go ahead and try this again uh chat please give a warm welcome man uh to ross see if this works better there, there we go yeah there we, we go. can hear you man how you doing welcome to the show man thanks for having me i appreciate the opportunity to be here Good, good, man. So, um, uh, first things first for some of the people in the chat, man. Um, uh, if you don't mind just introducing yourself, you know, um, uh, a uh, little bit of your background, whatever you, you feel, uh, comfortable to share, uh, and sure. just, uh, uh, let us know a little bit about yourself, man. Yeah. So I've been uh, 30 years in the tech industry, working at a variety of companies ranging from Microsoft to VMware to Citrix, to IBM and blah, blah, blah. Um, outside of the tech career where mostly of my work has been either in product marketing or in large scale global partnerships um, and things like that. Uh, outside of that, I invest in tech companies. I'm on the board of two startups that are scaling up nicely, mm -hmm. uh, as well as doing what I call mailbox money investing, which is uh, investing in businesses that uh, are targeted to generate mailbox cash in the future, as opposed to buyout equity type stuff uh -huh. as part of retirement planning. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. Married cool. for kids, all that stuff. Right on. Um, so, uh, do you have a position in Bed Bath and Beyond? I'm assuming you do because uh, I see you're active in my uh, subreddit as well as the official r slash uh, bbby. Um, uh, uh, what, what's your? Uh, do you, you have a position, right, Ross? Yeah. So I bought around two hundred and ten thousand shares. Wow. As a, well, as a value investment, then I bought yeah. more. Now I'm up to six hundred and sixty thousand shares. And those last. Holy cow couple hundred thousand when it fell to eight cents that just became me spitefully buying stuff one day <laughs> Fuck it. yeah let's buy more yeah buy more. you're in the right place then <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I mean, at that point it, it's like i can either put that or the ponies and i like uh, the chances on bed bath and gone more than the ponies mm -hmm. yeah Awesome. Um, so uh, I know uh, Michael has a couple of questions. I know some of these guys do. Uh, real quick before uh, I get into it, I got a ton of people who submitted questions uh, for Ross tonight. So, <laughs> and if there's, <laughs> yeah, uh, and if there's anything you know that you can't uh, touch on, just let us know that um, uh, you'd prefer to pass on the question. And uh, yeah, we, we let me just give a general disclaimer right now. Anything sure. I think here is my personal opinion and not me acting as a spokesperson for Oracle because yep. it's me talking about my personal opinion. Right. Second, nothing I'm going to tell you is good financial advice, the most less financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Get those disclaimers out. Man. Um, so yeah, uh, just keep in mind, uh, Ross is here just on his own free will. He is not here uh, on behalf <laughs> of... <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, he's uh, he's not uh, here on behalf of Oracle or, or his place of work or anything like that. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, so again, uh, I guess we'll start with ABC or uh, Travis or, or Citizen or Michael. Uh, do any of you guys have a couple questions for Ross here uh, um, before we move into some of the questions that the community asked? Um, would love to hear. I have one just to start it off. Um, sure. How, how does your position and your reaching out to RC directly in any way, uh, have any type of conflict with the uh, Oracle contract that is it was either terminated or handled out of like settled um, in the court here or during the so, court. Um, I can first tell you it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Second, um, it's often whenever there's a bankruptcy or something. I'll just address this where there's going to be a division of assets, or you're going to sell off one part of the business to the other. It, Oracle has a vested interest in knowing who's taking what assets where, who's inheriting what contract. So it's not an unusual thing for them in a bankruptcy proceeding where there's talking about shedding or spinning things out to want to know where's our stuff going and how's it licensed. But that's a completely separate compliance team than anything I do in the public cloud. So it has nothing to do with that. Uh, my yeah. reaching out to Ryan Cohen it just had to do with our experience with Uber and Zoom and a bunch of other, you know, companies that have built scale cloud native environments where uh, infrastructure matters and things like the ability to run a distributed cloud matters. Like we can run cloud services on, you know, full rack solutions inside of warehouses to run robotic pick pack and ship systems. We do stuff at, you know, a materially lower cost. And I won't go into the whole why Oracle cloud pitch because I think you guys can probably find my LinkedIn and read the white paper I wrote on it. But yeah. Uh, you know, by and large, uh, you know, there's some advantages. We brought retail customers 
Um, and I think we can help them. So, you know, the, the essence of any good sales approach is to solve problems. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're talking about your stuff, you're already losing. If you're talking about how you can help them solve their problems, you got a shot at it. So right. I think we can, we can help them get full rack. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let me ask, let me ask you this. Yeah, don't mind that chat, Ross. Uh, they, no, they, say some, they say some crazy shit in there, man. Um, By the all way, right. this is this is intentional haircuts on my part. Uh, 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 I, someone in the chat fight said Ross looks like NoHo Hank. You know who NoHo Hank is, uh, Ross? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Funny ass I show. Can't, I can't do the Hungarian accent like that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, real quick, Ross, uh, I got to ask you, uh, when did you first take your uh, first position in Bed Bath Beyond? I am curious. Uh, June 20, 22, 21, uh, 22. I okay. Think. So, so right before the, the stock ran to $30 a share. Yeah. I, I was in at like $2 and six cents or something like that on the mm -hmm. first run. Mm -hmm. Um, held it through the 30. Yeah. My, my younger son, uh, my oldest son who's 35, he, mm -hmm. uh, he paper handed out at 30. Oh. But he's at the age. Well, he's also he made some profits. Money. Well, that money matters. Like at, yeah. at the age he was at, that's um, right. You know, I could, I could uh, he made my first grandchild, so I'm happy with his choices. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so, uh, whenever you invested in Bed Bath Beyond, I mean, what what was the reason that you bought it? Is it because? Uh, I, and I am curious. I'm assuming you also hold a, a GameStop position as well. GameStop. I also hold Icon Enterprises. A wow. That, yeah. Uh, as well as a, a pretty big loop ring position as well that it bought when it fell down yeah. quite a bit recently. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, I got into it because, well, first when Ryan started talking about his open activist investment letter and what he saw there, I did see the value of Bye Bye Baby. But beyond that, the distribution centers that they've created are, are pretty up to date. They're, mm -hmm. they're not really dealing with, you know, significantly aged out tech. Mm -hmm. And they're in relatively good positions. And like my background when I started my tech career was in a distributor. So, you know, I hate to think that in a digital world that place matters, but physical goods, place matters. And, right. you know, when you dig into the company, there was kind of clearly some, you know, I'll just say everybody makes choices. And there were some bad choices around debt and using it for stock buybacks when the stock was at a high price mm -hmm. that, you know, you could argue might be malfeasance or, you know, bad actors, or it might just be running a corporate playbook, trying to stay alive on a quarterly basis. So, right. so it, it is what it is, but yeah. you can see that those were bad choices. And whenever you see a good company making bad choices, there's an opportunity to get in on a value play. Yeah. Then, you know, with all the run up, run down and the heading towards bankruptcy, I got into the, you know, let's, uh, you know, back the truck up and you yeah. know, load up on it because you're selling lotto tickets for pennies mm -hmm. at that point. Um, real uh, quick, uh, um, Art Lopez with the five bucks. Uh, PP, can you say hi to my niece, uh, Agueres, uh Misna Gles? Uh, yeah, there you go, man. Uh, uh, right on. Appreciate the love. Uh, we also got uh, another tip here uh, from me. Uh, he's a full regard, one of us, nice. Uh, King, <laughs> <laughs> King Weenie with the two bucks. Ross, thank you for coming on and sharing your thoughts. Yeah, man, uh, we, we love having him tonight. Um, so I am curious. So I, I got to ask you this. So you, you, I, I'm assuming to be holding a, a position as large as yours in Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, you must believe that there is some uh, kind of connection between 6th Street and Ryan Cohen and these NDAs and redacted dockets that we're seeing. Uh, I'm, I'm curious your personal thoughts. Uh, why, what do you believe or how do you see like this play kind of playing out with who's involved? You, uh, you also mentioned you have uh, Icon Enterprises, so I'm assuming yeah. maybe you think there's a connection there. What are your thoughts, Ross? Well, I think Icon Enterprises is undervalued right now, period, full stop. So regardless of whether there's a connection or not, the... Um, Hindenburg uh, hit piece on them was a great entry point buy opportunity for a stupid high dividend stock. So, I mean, that's kind of on its own value. If there's no connection there or not, it's still, to me, it hit a value level that I just was like, well, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I believe in the Teddy hypothesis. And I'll just, this is going to be a bit of a rant here, but I live in Seattle. So mm -hmm. I'm surrounded by Amazonians and Microsofties and Googly type people and Oracle type people and all mm -hmm. sorts of folks involved in the cloud business. And there's an undercurrent of, um, 
you know, Amazon was an innovative company from a distribution and goods standpoint, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, but it has kind of gone down a brutal efficiency path as opposed to a customer delight path. And if you back up and look and say, you know, what's the, the end of, you know, these sorts of paths for race to the bottom on efficiency, you see Target going after Walmart with a better, better brand loyalty, you know, similar prices are not terribly priced differently, but you know, the feel of a Target when it first came out 20 years ago compared to the feel of a Walmart was totally different. Yeah. And so there's a, a little bit of an aspect of this, of the market is highly ready for more curated and cultivated experiences and something that follows more into brand life cycle of a, of a customer as opposed to transactions. You know, when you look at Chewy, that's, you know, pet life cycles are, uh, depending on whether you're looking at uh, anything from mayflies to tortoises, anywhere from a couple of hours to 120 years, but typically 12 to 15 years for most household pets and stuff. That's an appropriate life cycle to build a lifetime customer value and to be maniacal about that experience from first day the puppy comes home to condolences at the end. Babies are no different in mm -hmm. the whole life cycle of being a grandparent right now. I'm telling you is like hit a nerve inside of me of, I want to create great experiences with her, not just, I got to find a bargain crib. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I do think there's also GameStop holds a place in people's hearts. I, I was an eighties kid, you know, I was born in 67. So I'm 13 in 1980 when Atari, you know, starts taking off and all that stuff. And when Babbage's became GameStop, I was right there the entire time. So a lot of childhood memories, going and buying the Nintendo 64 for my son and then buying games for him yeah. you know, back in the early 2000s. That was a you know, memory experience of camping out to get and hope you get something better than Wave Race, right? Yeah. No, <laughs> uh, I, I agree. I so, that. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the thing where you have these brands that carry high loyalty, but you've got an e-commerce experience that's devoid of those moments. And I think there is a notion about how do you bring electronic scale and bring efficiency to an e-commerce and all the modern data science stuff that you can do with really understanding, delighting customers and whatnot. So when I look at kind of the, the hypothesis behind what could really take on an Amazon, it would have to be a multi-brand experience that has a mix of brick and mortar as well as web. The brick and mortar has to have efficient distribution models, which I think Bed Bath & Young has. I think GameStop didn't. Yeah. Um, I, I think when you look at the net operating losses and some of the structures inside of how to financially make this work. Mm -hmm. It makes sense, you know? Yeah. So for me, there's this, there's a macroeconomic thing of, is the market ready for a competitor to take on Amazon and actually win? I think, you know, following the Jack Trout's 22 laws of immutable laws of marketing, every market becomes a two horse race. All right. Who's, who's Amazon's competitor? Walmart.com? Mm -hmm. No. Like nobody has any brand loyalty to Walmart. I, I, sorry, with deference to folks in the South that I grew up around, right. there might be some people that have deep loyalty in Bentonville and stuff, but I don't think the average consumer feels a deep connection to Walmart. So yeah. what's going to be the emotional brand that causes people to think differently about e-commerce? Well, Chewy did it. So could you do that with like a bunch of other things? Possibly. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the thesis. Then I look at, you know, stuff like Estrella, where they've built a blockchain ledger already for tracking equities. And the fact that Bed Bath & Beyond gives them access to Equinity as a, as a DRS agent, as opposed to computer share, which is not only stuck in Melbourne, Australia, they're stuck in the 1980s. Yeah, that notion of there being better tech to be able to drive what could be a tokenized ERC 20 stock offering mm -hmm. and having a non broker model that, that to me gets way out onto the what's possible, but the, the parts are there, which I mean, could be done. I mean, isn't that done yeah. for private companies only? I was reading yeah. about Australia and, and I was wondering how that would interface with public company or a DPO company at that point. Well, we've already got the capability of having crypto assets inside of most brokers now. So the question becomes, yep. can you build a ledger that actually can fuel those crypto assets? Mm -hmm. Right. That's not a like blockchain doesn't have a size limitation of like the way NASDAQ does. If you get to more than 500 registered investors, you got to go public. You know, so they built it to be for private companies, for private equity and things like that. And it's a pretty good platform for tracking cap tables. But yeah. there's nothing That's really right. holding it back from public equ equities other than deciding to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, cool. Yeah, I was I hadn't seen anything about uh, them uh, like shift over to public, but it's with your experience, it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like they just Yeah, I mean, you just dig into 
really what's behind a blockchain ledger. It's a immutable list of transactions. Uh, how many? Yeah, well, I mean, no, I, 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 I was wondering about your loopring comment because um, I was wondering about whether or not you believe that uh, they would integrate that 1155 well, also got, uh, token you know, or something like that. So zero knowledge rollups are a whole different subject. I think there's a ton of value in this notion of frictionless transactions that can be done on a shared visible transmutable and non-transmutable ledger. Um, you know, whether that's player in the game platform or whether it's Snoop Dogg, you know, doing, you know, NFT contracts mm -hmm. that have royalty elements into it and stuff. All of those things, I think we're on the cusp of doing a ton of those, you know. Um, so, I, I don't know. coconut cream, by the way, to the question you asked what my favorite pie was. My <laughs> well, answer it. We got to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my grandmother actually was the pastry chef for a Sizzler Steakhouse. Oh, so, excellent. Yeah, that, that, that hurt. Um, so uh, let me uh, go ahead and read this here. Uh, Salvatore with the two GB, uh, GBP. Ross has very relevant experience. Right on, man. Uh, we also had a uh, um, another chat here. I think it's still here uh, from uh, SHF Butt Rammer. <laughs> Butt Rammer has been short uh, Hedgie's daddy since 2021. Spankled spankled that butt twice already and i'm about to do it again give me those tendies moon soon appreciate the love man we got a uh um 25 knock from elling ross ross definitely fucks he's got four <laughs> kids to prove it all right right on <laughs> uh eb with the five thanks for coming on the show fellow seattleite here it's currently raining in north ballard all right yeah. Right on. Um, uh, Citizen, man, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to touch up on uh, uh, in terms of your question that you had uh, backstage there? Um, yeah, so basically what you're you're suspecting is that, uh, like, you know, there's a lot of promise in the Affinity Estrella uh, option. And I do agree with you 100% that, you know, getting to factor authentication for me to share, like, two months ago was, was like, they should have done it a long time ago. There's a lot of people, a lot of money in there. But, yeah. um, you know, like, over under what's the what do you see like as a uh chances that it's actually gme over like iep or, or dragonfly you know, or it, it, I, I think um I, this is 100 percent speculation in every possible way so this is but you look at lego box and you say what are all the pieces you need to really pull off a dex equity offering and make it work for the average consumer right so you've got to have some way of being able to track who actually has shares from the company. All right, so that's Australia. You've got a blockchain ledger, but that doesn't give you a transaction capability or a wallet or any of that other stuff. So you need a GameStop wallet. You need some ability to have transactions not be expensive. So you either need Tyco as a layer three to get it really, really low cost and layer loop, bring down a layer and, and do the whole zero knowledge roll up within a zero knowledge roll up that gets brutally inexpensive and then you need some sex to dex you know how do you get to a wallet that's held by fidelity so you can hand it to this person and their broker can tell them yes you own bed bath and beyond and it's here the really interesting part for me is where do you do national bid ask and how does it follow more of a coin model as opposed to a security model because if you eliminate the margin on bid ask and it goes straight to hey here is the gas fee for doing this transaction and the bid ask is the same price do you start really getting out of sec jurisdiction and into you own a currency called fill in the blank teddy gamestop or whatever now who would do it first i don't care it's just a matter of time before someone does it because you know if you look across you know every single one of the meme stocks there's a recurrent theme of we don't know how many shares there really are okay well this is what tech is designed to do is to solve problems that you know, we can't solve in regulatory ways, you solve in technical ways. So, you know, why do we have vaults? Because the laws that said don't steal money didn't work. So we built tech. Why are we building decentralized finance? Because the laws that said, here's the regulations for centralized finance didn't work. Mm. So tech tech fills those vacuums so fast. It's it's not a it's not a question of, of if, it's when. Yeah. Um, so we had a question from a user, um, projectus 94 
And I think this is one that you responded to. Um, and uh, he said, uh, why is he bullish on RC and the baby thesis, which we got into a little bit um, with what you were explaining. But uh, this user did say, does other people in his industry understand what is going to play out? I've always wondered this as he is a as he is top in the industry. And I'm sure he also discusses investment with a lot of people he is connected to. Um, how would you like to answer that? And uh, your response was, let's talk live about it. But largely, there is a collective belief in systems at work at all levels, yeah. despite evidence. So why don't you uh, build up uh, a little bit of uh, what that means? Well, I mean, uh, I'll just say people in executive roles have a tendency to be really deep on a narrow set of things mm -hmm. and just like everyone else in every other way. I mean, um, I, I know I'm friends with a lot of folks who have been very successful. And let me tell you, they struggle with getting ribs right on the grill and they struggle with, you know, how do I figure out how to match these pants and these shirts together? I mean, just because you're really deep in one area, it doesn't mean it, it goes to everything. So this notion of, hey, I'm really smart at building, you know, DevOps management software doesn't necessarily translate to, I can see fiduciary crimes happening everywhere like Batman of the SEC, right? <laughs> yeah. It right. doesn't necessarily translate. So yeah. then you have to look and say, what's the mode of operation a lot of these folks have? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward, which is, you know, I'm trying to excel in a narrow area where I know the rules. And if you're going to tell me the rules aren't working, I have to just look and say whether the things I'm doing within those rules are working. And otherwise, I'm not going to question it a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, the belief in systems is real of, you know, this is how things work. And if you start going to them and say, oh, by the way, do you know what happening with short hedge funds and what they're doing with rehypothetication and what's mm -hmm. happening with, you know, synthetic stocks that are traded in offshore swaps and they look at you like you're Charlie Day on It's Always Sunday in Philadelphia. So yeah, you have to choose what conversations you want to have. Right on. Um, so uh, real quick, uh, Doha uh, with the $2 tip, not your typical suit. Respect, Ross. All right, right on. Well, they Our did say dress, dress for the job you want. It might retire <laughs> boat captain. There you go. <laughs> uh, Art with the five bucks. Pee, Pee can you say hi to my kid, Chupa uh, Mishuevos? Right on. <laughs> Uh, I have no fuck. I have no idea what that means, man. You just said suck my balls. Yes. <laughs> Damn, you named your kid that, man. Art, right, what the fuck, man? Um, all right, cool. Uh, ABC, did you have a, a question maybe uh, uh, for Ross here? Or um, uh, uh, don't worry about you. Skip Travis there. Uh, or, or Michael. Uh, if not, it's all good. I, I have a couple other ones that I want to ask, but uh, uh, just want to leave it open for you guys too. Yeah, very one dimensional, Ross. Appreciate you being on the show. Um, yeah. I guess with your speculation in terms of Teddy and where RC is going and his GM play, uh, play and then, you know, the, the idea of loopering and everything like that with where you stand. And again, keeping Oracle side because you're here on personal time. What, if I understand correctly, really one of the competitive advantages of Oracle is that they intertwine the financial aspect within uh, their, their programming and such. Would you say that you, as a competitor to maybe some of the others out there in the same industry uh, are better suited to get us onto this digital and blockchain and, and, and move us ahead in that, 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 that era. Yeah. Well, and I'll just touch on this at a high level, which is ERP. It, um, there was a question that was in the sub earlier about Microsoft ERP dynamics versus. Oracle. Yes. Yes. Let me just try to characterize something this way that will help people understand. Um, when you look at an enterprise resource planning app, one of the ways to measure it is table complexity, like how many relational tables are in this application. So if you look at something like QuickBooks, there's like a thousand tables in it. When you look at something like NetSuite or Dynamics, you're in the 60 to 100,000 tables. And a table is something like, you know, warehouse locations or customer numbers or whatever you want. When you look at SAP or you look at Oracle EBS, you're in the half a million to a million table type environments. Well, what does that mean? Well, it just means more processes can be mapped inside the system. Was an ERP get you processes? Sure. It doesn't get you any competitive advantage because your business is unique. And where most people end up messing up in ERP instances, they buy something way too complicated for what they need. That's sweet. Maybe what you need instead of the EBS or they don't have their shit together. And to be blunt, they haven't really thought through their strategy. They haven't really thought through their processes. So when it comes time to what rules do you want to put in the system to make it follow what you want it to do, they don't know. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so there's gaps and other stuff that starts getting exposed. So anyway, you know, a lot of people are like, can ERP do blockchain? Sure, we've got it happening right now, blockchaining supply chain from source all the way through to shelf in multiple customers. But does your business support that? So the short answer to all the questions that were in the sub of ERP is, it can do anything you want it to do with enough time and money. Nobody has that much time or money. So you've got to sort of make choices about where are you really going to make strategic impact? Where do you do off the shelf processes and where do you decide to keep humans in the mix just to make it work better? Right. Um, all right. So I got a question for By you, way, Ross. That's yeah. the most I've talked about ERP in three years. Wow. Yeah, I'm in a different part of the business. I do cloud infrastructure. Right, right. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, uh, in terms of tinfoil, how much of the tinfoil do you believe, Ross? Uh, well, none of the stuff having to do with the cute hints on Twitter and stuff like that. I think they are alluding to obviously a moonshot and a company being launched and sure. multiple things coming together. I think that's pretty obvious. But, you know, the 741s and showing up everywhere and all that stuff, you know, at some point we're, you know, we're breathing the ethylene gas. I, I got to say this, but Carl Icahn, man, considering his age, man, he doesn't really fuck with that stuff. And, you know, he had the first off, the Bahamas picture just taped up behind him was very bizarre. You look at any other interview, you don't see that. Then I, I know it sounds crazy, man, but at seven minutes, 41 seconds or sorry, seven minutes, uh, 41 seconds of the of the video, he moves out of the way and the and the clock is 147. So, you know, how do you explain stuff like that, Ross? I mean. How does that uh, process in your mind when you see things, things so like that? Two things. One, it's it's cute. If he's doing it intentionally, it's wonderful. It's not an investment thesis, so it's not a basis. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> right? But, okay. but what do you think about but, but, it? But hold on. It's also a little bit of the Bay of Fundy effect. Uh -huh. which, if you look that up psychologically, the Bay of Fundy effect is like, when's the last time someone talked to you about the Bay of Fundy? I don't even know what that is. It's in Nova Scotia. It's in Northern Canada. It's got a big title swing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is sometime in the next two weeks, you're going to see the Bay of Fundy or something related to it somewhere mm -hmm. because you've been primed for it. You're looking for it. So as a result, we've been primed for 147 or 741 or 471 or whatever combination it is. Mm -hmm. As a result, we end up seeing it everywhere. It's you, you can go down the Jim Carrey 23 movie at this point if you go too far with it. But mm -hmm. it, to me, it's not an investment thesis. We've all been primed. But for why it. is it there, man? Like, like honestly, how's the timing there? Is like what I'm so confused about. You've been you've been primed to notice it. <laughs> it must be man or or it's another coincidence Look, right i this mean is one of the things like i will i will say half of it could be intentional but half of it is priming of right. people just seeing it right like sure. so, oh my god i woke up at 147 this morning and my alarm <laughs> clock was you know staring at me blinking and it was blinking in the same meter well that maybe it's the was, universe yeah it could be or it could be <laughs> you know powerful uh you know uh universe that that we live in um but I, I am curious um, in, in terms of when I say like the tinfoil, obviously that that, yes, is, is the tinfoil, but more of so like the speculation that that Carl Icahn is the one behind Sixth Street um, and uh, uh, Ryan Cohen being listed throughout the dockets. I mean, it, it, do you feel like that's a strong enough thesis to to have maybe some connections? I mean, and again, Carol Flatten is, is a part of the board as well. Um, yeah. uh, that's Look, your connection with Carl through Xerox. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of connecting dots here, but you know, I'm just curious your opinion on that. Well, I mean, you could go back to they rule.net or any of these other sites and see how interconnected boards are. So I wouldn't put too much stake in there. They, they all mm -hmm. definitely know each other, mm -hmm. but that said, um, you know, do I believe Carl Icahn is at a swan song of his career gearing up to absolutely destroy hedge funds that have been in his backside since the eighties? Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, it's likely, honestly, yeah. If you could, uh -huh. and the situation was there like we know it is, and mm -hmm. you're primed and you've just taken several billion dollars worth of capital out of your investment fund and held it as collateral to go get cash to go do something when the market's at a peak valuation right now, I don't think he's rolling it into Apple and I don't think he's rolling it into Tesla. So my guess is he's found something that gives him incredibly high leverage mm -hmm. um, that you know, he's in. So mm -hmm. is it this? Well, it makes a ton of sense to me. Um, I would certainly see this de-seller boxing a whole bunch of brands as a way to kind of do the fight fight club scene at the end of it in the financial markets as, yeah. a, you know, with gas cans. So, right. you know, as much as that guy loves really, you know, 
being an activist and getting value out of companies, I think this, you know, opportunity to go after some value destroyers isn't a bad thing, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know, maybe, and you know, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. It's not a basis for investing, but the other reasons are, but it doesn't hurt it. Right. Uh, Michael, did you have a question yeah. um, uh, for us? Yeah. So I was just like, when I, when I think about Teddy, um, I actually, I had a thesis, you know, I mean, I know how to be talking to you. So, I mean, if, since you work for Oracle, but I, my thesis was actually that Ryan Cohn would make his own ERP um, system just because like the, the difference between, you know, an enterprise uh, resource planning. And then it, I guess it used to be just a material resource planning that like it, it, I think it went from being having a product that like a company had invested in and wanted to stand behind to being like a sales centric one. And, uh, you know, like you can sell a product before you've even made it and you can, yeah. um, you know, you end up like kind of trapping in people like my grandpa who was like, you know, before he passed away, you know, was so medicated up like with his heart meds and all these things that like, you know, he was he was the best customer. And I'm sure any ERP system would say, oh, he's like a high priority like customer because he'll just buy whatever. And so I think that Ryan Cohen's like instead of being sales centric, it was more of a customer delight centric. Yeah. And so it, it would make sense to have to make a whole new product. Yeah, I, I, I really encourage you to really embrace this notion of how many tables are we talking about here? And what I mean by that is all that table density means is how many functions do you have? So mm -hmm. a given massive ERP system like, you know, ours or SAPs or anybody else's, you're going to look at that and go, well, it's a general ledger. It's an accounts payable. It's an accounts receivable. It's a supply chain management. It's warehouse management. It's customer management. It's marketing campaign managers. It's all these things and on and on and on. And the question becomes, which ones of those do you not need off the shelf that you need to do something that creates value for your business different than anyone else? Well, mm -hmm. okay. He may yeah. look at that and go, well, my customer management, knowing the data science behind my customer's preferences and being able to map life events, all that stuff is proprietary things that I'm going to build and plug into the accounts payable and accounts receivable. So the short answer is nobody builds their ERP system. Everybody takes an off the shelf ERP system and then decides what parts of it do I need to that, innovate? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And it's just, where is that innovation? Okay. And this is kind of, uh, I'll go back to Jeffrey Moore and the Chasm Group and their work they did after the Crossing the Chasm. Mm -hmm. They had this notion of core and context. And this notion of core is, what are the things that are going to absolutely drive shareholder value and customer value for us? Those are the things we need to put all of our dollars and thinking and brains into making absolutely the best. And what are the things that make sure as the facility guys get the trash taken out on time? Let's hire somebody to do that. We don't need to build a system. So where do you go put IP? You go put IP in the things that are going to make a difference. You put your energy into that. You just buy everything off the shelf that doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, so obviously you're aware of uh, uh, Teddy based off um, uh, Michael's question here. But I am curious. Uh, Teddy was registered as a bank in Delaware. Yeah. Yet we have trademarks uh, from Teddy that are international trademarks, towels, bed stuff, you know, things like that. Uh, what are your thoughts, man? What is Teddy, uh, in your opinion? Oh, my guess is it's an Amazon competitor that's coming as a multi-shop experience. It, like there's room for brand loyalty right now. It's one of the things Amazon's done a good job of destroying. Like, I think one of the, this is going to get me in trouble with, uh, my Seattle friends, but one of the worst <laughs> things is the Amazon choice products where they just basically look at the data science of what are people buying and let's go find somebody to make a cheaper version of it, mm -hmm. which in essence is debranding the, right. the product people prefer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's okay. If you're doing a truly commodity stuff, I mean, it's, it's okay. Right. But where do you start understanding quality? How do you really start understanding that mm -hmm. this last time I bought it, it was the same supplier that was contracted the next time I bought it. So I, I think this notion around things that people have an emotional connection to, like their children, like babies, like, you know, their household, those things where you build, you know, life, it starts becoming brand relevant. So I, I think Teddy's setting that up really well. Why is it a bank? Well, I can come up with an innocuous answer and I come up with a really, really wild answer. The innocuous answer is like I used to run when I was at Microsoft, I ran worldwide partner strategy there. And so part of that job is, you know, how do we process the one point seven billion dollars in partner incentives they spend every year to reward partners for doing things like selling Azure and selling Office 365 and that sort of stuff? OK, well, um, 
you know, that's a pretty complicated system and it's, it's pretty hard to think about how do you, you know, do things like sell subscriptions and stuff. And so at one point we looked at doing things like prepaid cards for Office 365. So a partner could do a prepaid license. Turned out we had to become a bank in every jurisdiction in order to hold customers money. Yeah. Okay, we didn't want to do that. So mm -hmm. we stopped that thing dead in the tracks. It could be as simple as for gift cards, we're going to have pre-stored pre value cards and we have to be a bank in Delaware in order to process those things. Let me ask you this. So here, here's the issue though. So uh, it's registered as a bank, but under uh, banking law in Delaware, uh, because it's an LLC, they can't register as a bank. So how would they be a bank without being registered as an official bank? But do you think it's kind of like an umbrella? I mean, how, how would you... Do you well, think maybe they just check marked it wrong? I mean, I can't imagine a guy well, as big as Ryan would mark it wrong, right? Yeah. Um, you could change the paperwork and say, hey, we're amending our original application and now we're becoming a. I mean, it could be. So they can just change their tax status of whatever yeah. LLC to something else. Okay. Right. That's easy to do, but it gets you started with the regulatory framework. I don't know. The other wild example is hey, GameStop Wallet's going to have actual financial assets in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I need to have, think about regulatory, and especially when allow lending against it and all the stuff Looper talks about about be your own bank. If you take that to its logical extreme, you need to have somebody who's a regulatory agency. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, it, except it wasn't GameStop; it was Teddy. Yeah, right. And so, I mean, I understand what you're saying with the GameStop and them having their own wallet. That would make complete sense for them to have you a know, you subsidiary or entity. But you can change the branding on a wallet pretty easy. It's just a digital asset. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and, my guess that all this stuff gets rolled into an entity where you would it be easier experiences, you know would would it be easier to do a reverse merger for teddy um and or or to do a public offering you know like is there what would you say the advantages or disadvantages between? it's far easier to do a reverse merger and have a pooling of assets under that reverse merger you eliminate a lot of the regulatory paperwork you have to go through it becomes like you could there's a way to do it where you're able to roll the assets and keep a majority of the 51% on Bed Bath & Beyond owners intact to get the NOLs, but still roll the NOLs into a reverse merger where it goes into GameStop, then GameStop ends up reversing Teddy into it. But, you know, that's what guys like Kirkman and Ellis get paid a ton of money to figure out how to do. Wow. But look, there's nothing to hold them back from being able to combine these entities in a way that makes the most sense for driving the brand experience they want to drive. Mm -hmm. Now, are they going to telegraph that until they're ready to do it? Why would they? Like, I mean, there's no no reason to give a chance to put the competitor's shoes on. Right. And so do you believe that this uh, stock is uh, experiencing uh, one of the biggest bear traps that we're possibly witnessing in history? Or or do you think that, uh, for instance, there's a lot of, lot of conversation that happens in both subreddits where it's 50-50. People believe the board was not on their side. The board was on their side. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, the, the board's on the side of their, their, their shareholders and their debtors. So, you know, this is where if you look at the way Sugov and Etlin and all those folks have behaved, they've behaved completely in line with the fiduciary interests of the people that own the equity and own the debt associated with it. Now, once the debtor in possession really became the dominant holder and was able to collaborate with the ad hoc bondholders group or whoever Sixth Street is representing in that particular name, um, then it sort of became, you know, aligned interests between the acquirer debtor in possession combined with what, you know, the board was trying to get done for maximizing value. Mm -hmm. look, look, getting rid of the loans was the biggest thing. As soon as that's done, then it starts becoming, you've got an acquirer who has a fiduciary interest to the money behind that acquirer. And you have an acquiree that has a fiduciary interest to the people that are stakeholders in that acquiree they're not going to be on the same page until the deal is announced and done. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for some, you know, kumbaya alignment before a deal, somebody is not following their fiduciary duty. If you see that happening. Yeah. So. Um, we had a question, I think from cheese. Uh, I must've missed it. Uh, what was cheese? What was your question, man? Uh, I think he, Oh, tipped. come on. Look, I got a comment on something here. Yeah. I absolutely eat ramen. I eat ramen two <laughs> times a week. You're kidding me? Right Ross, on. Is Ross is an eight, man. Uh, one I, of I us. Just, one of us. <laughs> I just uh, <laughs> the Costco tonkatsu ramen they make right now. That stuff is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. A little rotisserie chicken in it. Pull that in there. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we actually found uh, the cheese is a uh, uh, questionnaire. It was actually a two dollar tip. My apologies, cheese. Uh, he says, uh, "What's your price target on the stock, or the maybe ball price stock yeah. ballpark? No price Why? stock. Okay, all right. Why? Okay. Why? I guess everyone's always curious. They ask it all the time to random people too. You know, price or I mean, I, let me ask you this. This is a better question. What do you personally think in in your mind what the value of the stock is worth? I mean, what do you feel? That's uh, irrelevant. It's irrelevant to a short squeeze. So, what do I think it's worth? I think the entire company right now is worth somewhere between. Uh, well, it really depends, and I got to be careful in this one because it depends on how it emerges as a brand. If it emerges as an right. e-commerce first brand, mm -hmm. it's you know Molly bar the door. It's going to start at ten billion and go up from there. If it's a store brick and mortar driven brand and they're still figuring out e-commerce and they haven't figured out how to roll stuff together to make it a one-stop shop, then, you know, sub billion dollars, mm -hmm. which is more than the same. But I don't think anybody's buying it to keep doing what Bed Bath & Beyond was doing. Well, uh, I, I thought that yeah. they, they'd have basically flagship stores to show off their the, the items, but it would mainly be e-commerce and through yeah, like look, this has been, if you study like the trends that go on in retail, there's a, a startup called digital brands that was exploiting this, which was, you had these companies that are digital only experiences like clothing brands, like, um, DNM and uh, denim and a couple others that were out there and they really needed to get brick and mortar stores. So they've started building locations that have five or six different online brands as stores you could go and see the quality now does it have every size and stuff no of course not it's there for you to see the quality of the merchandise see how it's put together to see it's not made by you know workers that's going to fall apart in two minutes it's, it's right. a quality thing then you go get it sized online you buy it and you do the whole experience so this blending of uh what did my wife used to call it bricks and clicks you know how do i take the e-commerce play and put it together with you know retail so you're driving an experiential sensory brand experience in retail and you're driving an efficiency and convenience play in e-commerce mm -hmm. they go on that path done yeah, like, yeah. So I'm, not, I'm not gonna, the biggest fear of me buying an online crib is it's going to collapse in the middle of the night and kill my granddaughter mm -hmm. all right i actually want to go shake the crib like yeah. i want to know this thing's solid right yeah yeah, I can't do that with Amazon. That that's the same way with uh, my sister had a child recently too, and um, uh, she was the same way. She was very adamant on actually uh, seeing the crib and and interacting right. with it before purchasing it. Um, real quick, uh, one hundred one Nas with the five uh, NZD at PP Show. Please ask Ross his his length and girth ratio. <laughs> and then we had a two uh, two dollar tip for Mo Money. Length to girth ratio is infinite when squeezes. The cheese with the two dollar tip. He said, "Squeeze." I'm okay with that answer. Thanks. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Guys they're wild. Get, they're uh, wild. Fucking nuts. So uh, yeah, no uh, <laughs> no reason to answer that. One. Oh, so I had a question. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I caught a lot of flack for uh, saying that that the over never shake you. a baby. I'm just gonna do ECU. Never shake a baby. No. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> Um, that the overstock <laughs> deal was was more of a partnership because uh, uh, because Bed Bath and Beyond worked with like Blue Yonder and didn't you know it wasn't really profitable for them to just be because Blue Yonder didn't really have any skin in the game they were just kind of getting paid no matter what yeah and so how how would a, a partnership or if you believe that between Overstock and Bed Bath work? I have no idea. I mean, fundamentally, I, I don't know that overstock. I mean, I can see, again, this is one out of the air, okay? Yeah. But I can see because overstock, one of the things they have is a really strong China supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they are in many cases where goods get diverted when it doesn't have a wholesale home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of been their business model is, hey, we shipped it to the U.S. and the order got canceled and it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to ship it back. Or this is goods that we need to take off store shelves because a new version's coming. So we need to dump them. So for the low end of just convenience stuff and the ability to have a sort of high volume, high margin relative to cost acquisition retail mm -hmm. supply chain, it's not a bad way to get rid of merchandise that you want to get out of your system. Right. And every retailer, I don't care whether it's, you know, video game chairs or towels or whatever, eventually you want to rotate inventory and, and make shelf space. So yeah, I, I can see that connection, but yeah. 
Um, I just meant like that you'd have that, that Bed Bath would have to have their own like their their own techs and 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 all their programmers and whatnot to like maintain a website. Whereas just that the website portion of it and having you know the shipping infrastructure and all that like that Overstock could be I, leveraged. I don't think we're going to review cascading style sheets here, but it's really easy to skin a website. So, I yeah. mean. The back end e commerce engine and logic can look like anything on the presentation layer. You mm -hmm. can build the integrations really straightforward, like really straightforward to be able to do things like replication of inventory between databases and stuff. That, that's all, like, I hate to say it, it's just filter, but fets or valves and antifreeze now. It's so all. Do you think um, like Teddy would come in then and, and, and then buy it out? Because I, I think there was some stipulation that it wasn't necessarily official with Overstock, or what, what do you think, like, the, the, what 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 is your opinion about Overstock's relationship with uh, Bed Bath and Beyond? Do you think it's going to go I don't in think different I, directions? I have no idea, but I mean, I do know that it has to be at an arm's length transaction. So if there's any relationship there between any potential dip facility and Overstock, it's already breaking the rules. So my guess is this was a hey, we need to get a stocking horse bidder to say we can't pay these leases. We need to cancel these things. Like right. they had to show cause for bankruptcy and going out and saying, we tried to sell the brand and we tried to sell the baby thing. And mm. you know, all we got was a chain smoker in Miami and we got this overstock guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is what I said actually yeah. earlier. That was one of my theses. So. Yeah. That was very bizarre in court. Uh, real quick, uh, EB with the two bucks chat puts the fun in dysfunction. And then uh, also we got a uh, $10 from Slobo, a character jumping in the air, jolly saying yippee right on. Um, real quick. Uh, uh, I do need to use the bathroom real quick. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to go use it. Uh, just want to say we did hit a new PP show record, man. 962 Ooh. viewers, man. Wow. Yeah. Holy cow. Uh, it's dropped off a bit, but, uh, wow, that's, that's fucking nuts, man. Uh, give me a moment. I'll be right back. You guys just, uh, uh, keep, uh, Ross, uh, entertained what? until I get <laughs> back. Because uh, building on the question of like, do other execs know, go, go use. The yeah. Question, do your thing. Um, but you know, building on the comment about, uh, you know, do other execs know this? I do have to tell you, uh, since I wrote that on Twitter, a ton of folks from the industry that I know in all levels, I'm talking you know, DevOps people, folks in partner alliance roles, folks at other companies who other side of the table and deals we've been on and stuff have all written me and been like, yeah, I'm in it too. Yeah, yeah. No, we've been in it since the beginning. No, we're all in. And so <laughs> like, I, I will tell you, there's almost like a conspiratorial tone about being <laughs> publicly identified with this where folks are coming in and they're, they're like, you know, I'm really excited about this too. And it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to see them talk about it. Like, you know, as, like in the 1990s finding somebody else was carrying weed at a concert it's like <laughs> you, you mean specifically bed bath and beyond or or, or just the the whole, the whole thesis gamestop bed bath and beyond the teddy thesis the, none of them have anything to do with a movie theater though that that shit show right <laughs> That's actually the first thing I said when I came on the show was when ABC was uh, running the show. I came on, I, I said I was ready to come out of the closet as a Bed Bath & Beyond holder because like I, I finally, I felt like we had gone through the door where it, it, it was all, it was all going to happen. Like all the pieces had come together in my opinion. And so I was right. like, I, I'm, I'm on the right side of history now. So yeah, we'll see. I, 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 I feel the same way. All right, hey, else you guys I, I'll jump in. Um, I'm a I'm a big retail guy. I love retail. I love consumer behavior. I love the dynamics of being customer centric. Um, you touched earlier about you know you don't want to offend too many of your friends or or Amazon uh, uh, relationships. I guess. What do you think? Um, yeah, I get to eat in Seattle. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I, I guess really my 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 idea is that in order to be customer centric, you have to obviously have less churn as possible. And I believe you know Amazon's current current business model, um, they've kind of infiltrated the system. They've really made it about metrics and data and have avoided that customer service. And do you believe with a new player, if a new player was to come into the market and have already a, a, a slew of both verticals and product lines all at once, um, including possibly a streaming service, just like Amazon has, perhaps Blockbuster example, um, do you believe that they could instantly do 
damage to the market share of this main competitor because in business there's something called the rule of three where basically you know walmart uh whoever the competitors being is they own 80 percent because they're generalists and then you have the other niche specialists which have higher gms um what do you think do you think that a new uh amazon platform that competes using the leverage of branding such as you know possibly nike apple and other slew of other brands that might be coming to the table here do you think they could do immediate damage in terms of market share or do you envision a slow crawl because if they already have a brick and mortar process and they really identify the back end in terms of e-commerce and the the metrics and the data systems and and the platform that you build do you think they could literally do uh, damage to the market share of amazon immediately off the bat well um, I'm going to answer your question with a question, which I'm going to guess based on the beard, you're a similar age as me. Very um, <laughs> so when, when do you remember the moment you dropped MySpace for Facebook? I never actually hopped on MySpace, but I uh, remember those days though. Yeah. Do you remember when you dropped Facebook for Instagram? Yeah. Uh, well, I you... use both. Yeah. No, but my point behind it is, platform adoption yeah. and, and it's really a change in default behavior because right you had a place where you went and told people what was on your mind not that anyone was asking by the way but anyway <laughs> that's <the whole> thing. <laughs> yeah it's true but you had a place where you could go tell people what was on your mind and it went from one place to another that's the default behavior and that's the hardest thing in consumerism to change right how do you switch someone from oh i'll just get it on amazon to now, by the way, Walmart has spent a gobsmacking amount of money trying to figure out how to get people to change. And the short answer is it's not price. Like in, in my academic background is in behavioral science. And I'll tell you that the emotional nature of decision making is is absolute. Like we make emotional decisions and then we use logic to justify them to other people. 100%. So the reason you went from MySpace to Facebook or from Twitter to Instagram or whatever other platforms jumps you in is because somebody came to you and said, you got to do this. It's fantastic. We're all doing it. Okay. Well, that became an inducement moment of somebody's telling me they're having a really delightful experience. I want to participate in that emotion, right? Now you get over there and you're a little nervous and I don't know where my friends are and stuff like that. Eventually you start seeing people and you're like, well, this is not so bad. I forgot to update my last social media, but I, I updated this one. So I feel like I've kept people up to date. And next thing you know, you've changed default behavior. So what's going to lead to off of Amazon? It's going to cause a combination of enough bad things happening, like missed deliveries or it didn't get here in time, or I was promised this date and it didn't happen this date. Quality. Combined with the fact that there's not a way to really escalate anything and get any customer service. That goes headlong into a couple of important pieces like you know i'm gonna buy stuff for my son's new home i'm gonna buy stuff for his daughter i'm gonna buy stuff for my 12 year old you know those sorts of things are emotional buys not i'm buying toilet paper right so those emotional buys drive changes in behaviors if it's a great experience and you know i i don't know this is the hardest thing in consumer behavior is how to take what is a muscle memory and make it an intentional act and that's what he's got to do he's got to figure out how to really delight customers to the point where they say, you know, I, I'm waking up from this fog that while it's cheap, it's not a good experience and I don't, I don't like it. Right. And this is better. I don't know. How'd yeah. you probably be McDonald's? They had better food. They made people yeah. try it when they want it. And yeah. that's it. I um, think, yeah. Go ahead. Maybe I'll just quickly add, you know, oh, yeah. maybe, maybe the idea of a short squeeze, uh, possibly with a Carl involved in I can lift and RC lift and the amount of exposure and free advertising along with that customer centric or customer delight immediately right off the bat with a slew of product lines and products available instantly because you can't do this half-assed at the beginning. You have to have literally the entire smorgasbord if you do want to have it. Um, yeah, I agree 100% with you. All buying is based on emoji and then we use our logic to justify whether we're right in our principle of making that purchase or not. Um, I, 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 I foresee it making a, an immediate impact, but certainly you're right. I think it will take a little bit of a stretch. It'll be through word of mouth, obviously, that I'll get the, uh, the change in behavior. Yeah. So a, a couple of points I just want to uh, summarize on that one real quick. I, I think um, it's going to be quick. I, I, I And I don't mean to say this like, I, I'm just saying it's a logic problem. How many apes are there between GameStop, Bed Bath & Beyond and other sort of related? Uh, 240K, 240K, give or take. 
No, there's way yeah, more. No, than there, that. there's like just there's Super Punk has like uh, yeah, they have almost a million. Yeah, and my guess AMC is has six hundred thousand. WSB yeah, as guess. well. I, I'd you say it's it. well over a million. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. I Russ. think if you if you dedupe it, you're at about at a million, million and a half, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question. You go into a MOAS against multiple symbols. Who's going to have money? Us. <laughs> yeah. So here you've got this highly loyal, now all of a sudden disposable income environment where they get to make choices. I, I don't know a faster way to swing behavior than, hey, that guy, remember he used to work at the pizza shop? <laughs> yeah. He's worth $200,000 now. Yeah, it's yeah. Something to do with Eddie.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that story is going to get told in a lot of bars. By the way, a lot of money is going to get separated from early investors very fast, too. But mm -hmm. that's the fun I, thing. I was actually, I, I kind of was thinking about that, that um, basically if Ryan Cohen had two ways to raise money, or like if you're starting a business and you do an IPO, you're taking it from investors. And a lot of people will do an IPO and then just like jump out in a golden parachute. But it's like kind of cool that Ryan Cohen, if he's like going to raise money, but by sh squeezing the shorts and take it from Wall yeah, Street. Well, the, so it's the, like even better. I agree. And this is the one caution I have around, you know, uh, I don't set price targets or talk that way. But if you watch a GameStop, what he did was he did a secondary to raise money to pay off all his debts. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so he has a fiduciary responsibility to figure out with the combined entities of all these things, do I have enough of a war chest to go take on Amazon? Or do I need to issue shares or take the shelf registration for Bed Bath & Beyond that went nowhere when they withdrew that offering and refile that shelf offering as a secondary? Yeah. I don't know. So I'd be ready for, hey, we're going to take some money off the table to fund a step up in our balance sheet to go to war. Because it I did don't actually allude to that in the dockets about yeah. um, new shares. Uh, you know, So that's what I thought, I would too. Be, I would be ready for them to have a ceiling on the price because they're going to end up with a secondary. Now, hopefully they let it run into the hundreds or thousands. Uh, and I think you'll have it run out like it did before. But at some point it becomes, uh, how do I, you know, swap this for cash to build a war chest? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in terms of uh, IEP, you said you had a position. Uh, what yeah. interests you in IEP? And uh, do you believe that, for instance, like, as we know, Carl Icahn owns 83% of uh, IEP. Uh, what yeah. do you think? Do you think that his stock was what's the connection with his stock being shorted? And again, uh, mind you, the reason I bring this up is because some of the tinfoil we talked about earlier uh, with that interview you gave with the Bahamas and all that. Uh, shortly later, uh, his stock, uh, that Hindenburg article came out and his stock was shorted. Um, what do you think is any kind of connection possibly with Bed Bath & Beyond and them attacking uh, his equity in his company? I have no idea. I mean, I, he's an activist investor, and if he pulls out six billion dollars and and bankrolls a, a a pile of money to go do something, he's looking for something. And I, I think this is a reasonable thing. And all the people line up in terms of firms and stuff like that. So I, I think it's pretty interesting. Now, what's my interest in IEP? Mm -hmm. Dividends. Like I'm. Let's be really clear. I'm 56 yeah. years old. At some point. The problem with you know having investments in the equity market is you're looking for a thesis to be fulfilled, mm -hmm. yet you still want to take a vacation or you still want to you know eat. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to withdraw Ramen. money, right? Right. <laughs> so this notion of mailbox money of having dividend oriented stuff that pays out at a relatively high rate is not too uh -huh. bad, you know. Yeah, the dividend's pretty good. Pete would love to hear that. Pete loves the dividend off IEP. Um, Travis, man, uh, you've been kind of quiet, man. Uh, uh, you got anything, any interests at all, uh, for Ross here about the, the stock or maybe some of the dockets that maybe we've seen? Um, I mean, not, not on the dockets and Ross, sorry, I cut you off earlier when I was mentioning that you were talking about GME and, and Teddy kind of getting them intertwined. So apologize for the interruption there. And, uh, no, normally when it comes to me being in meetings or talking with C-suite, I normally try to stay quiet because I normally walk out of those with a lot more work to do. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, it's a lot more fun and entertaining. And I've, I've actually, I'm enjoying a lot of your insight. I'm sitting there going, Oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Or I'm not, you know, I didn't think about that. So, uh, thanks for joining. Um, but if, if I did have any questions, you know, it would be on the whole Tyco layer three, uh, loop ring and everything else. I know loop ring used to have kind of a digital exchange for swapping coins and, and crypto and everything else. And now that they've expanded, they have this layer two. Now they have Tyco layer three. You kind of have that DX 
uh, that's been built and kind of have a very, very great opportunity for their company. And I noticed you said that you were invested in loop ring as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I have some loops as well. Uh, but what, what are your thoughts and thesis on them becoming a future, you know, central, not, not centralized, I guess, uh, a, a, a core for the whole DEX market. So, um, Let's just start with the tech because that's the basis of the investment for me. Zero knowledge rollups are a brilliant way to solve a um, computationally increasingly difficult problem that's designed to get increasingly computational, which means increasingly power intensive, which isn't great from a environmental standpoint. So the ability to roll thousands, if not millions of transactions into a single, you know, Ethereum layer transaction and validate it, that has incredible value at being able to lower the friction of finance. And so if you think about like the decimalization of the stock market, where we went from doing things in an eighth of a dollar to moving to, you know, penny differences on the bid ask, it increased the velocity of money flow dramatically because in essence, there was less friction in it. You take that to zero, you take that down to near zero where it's, you know, I'm able to process the escrow for a mortgage for a dollar type thing instead of it being you know some tenth of a percent of the entire value of the escrow or whatnot why because it's just recording a transaction when all the conditions of the contract are met okay so that starts becoming really interesting about what happens when you don't need middlemen because the system itself contains all the things you used to need the middleman for right so I, I look at zero knowledge rollups and what blockchains are capable of doing as an immutable ledger is really solving the confidence problem that the reason banks and escrows and brokers exist. Mm -hmm. Why do you need a stockbroker? Because I need to know who's selling shares. Well, okay, you can get an app to be able to tell you who's selling shares. Now I need somebody to be an intermediary to hold the money and the shares as they cross hands. Well, you don't need that in the ERC-20 system either. So what's the point of middlemen? Like, yeah. let's centralize all that stuff. So that technology, I think, has profound implications to digital assets like music and movies, where you could set contract terms on resale for royalty percentages back to the artist, or the ability to have, you know, uh, systems that allow you to control the asset after it's been downstreamed, but nonetheless still own ownership rights on it. The notion of being able to take digital assets between platforms. And I, I was talking to my 12 year old about taking some Call of Duty assets over to Fortnite. She was a big fan of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, uh, well, one of the fun, she's got this like outfit in Roblox and these huge wings. And she's like, why can't I jump out of the Fortnite plane mm. wearing those wings? Like, that's you a know, question. It's interesting that you say something like that because, you know, I know GameStop has built basically that type of marketplace where it yeah. can take, you know, a percentage for the owner and give it back to the owner every time the transaction or every time a transaction occurs for that asset. So it seems like you have a great partnership between these two companies and we know that they've partnered up. It just seems that it's kind of just at its baby steps and it hasn't been implemented to its full potential right now. And mm -hmm. I I don't know. I, I think there's some great opportunities between the two companies to expand on that. And um, I don't know why GameStop kind of stopped or hesitated or paused their, you know, digital uh, evolution. But it, it seems that there's definitely something in the works for the future to that we have yet to see. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's a lot more going on in this space. And I, I think one of the fundamental problems that you have because in essence the zero knowledge roll-up is replacing trust systems well who controls trust systems right now banks SEC. Yeah. the sec you know it's it, things that are regulated centralized exchanges right now own the trust system so how do you transfer the public's trust from those central authority systems which you know are existed for a long time well it happens with two things happen one a new system comes along that looks and says, I can trust that. And the old one, they realize they can't trust it. Well, turns out if there's a whole bunch of illegally sold short shares that they have to end up covering it at bankrupts the DTC, no one's going to trust that system anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think you're kind of like, there's a pretty straightforward play here around value associated with a bunch of retailers being rolled together with an e-commerce play. And then there's a wild value play about rewriting centralized to decentralized commerce models. Yeah. So, uh, real quick, uh, let me just read this off here. Uh, EB with the five bucks, Fleetwood Mac and Cheese slap shills on Stockwitz. Right on, man. 
Um, we also have two questions that I just want to ask Ross real quick, and then Michael, you can take over. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Low B uh, with the ten dollar tip. Uh, Low B says, "Thanks for coming on, Ross. You said on Reddit that you have all or nearly all your Bed Bath DRS. Can yeah. you speak to why you feel this was the right call for this for this stock?" Well, um, there's a couple of different answers. The first answer was the original buy I did. I wanted to put in there because as it started becoming clear that when Ryan pulled out that the thing was going kind of funny, uh, I didn't want to be in a broker closeout if it went into zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of it was to be on the docket list and you know show up as a shareholder and all the other stuff. And then uh, to be honest with you, the stuff I bought at eight cents where I sort of loaded up on it, there might have been suburban involved when I DRS that where I was just <laughs> off. Wow. Yeah, was just what service chat. do you DRS with? Yeah. Well, it, it's Estrella is the guy's doing the or AST. Yeah, AST. Yeah, I'll Bed Bath and Gun, but computer share for Green GameStop. Yeah. Um, now that said, you know, there's I, I don't know that there's anything uh, like I think your broker matters. And to be really honest with you, I really my dad was in that business and I really do think you know, if your broker is, you know, payment for con contract for difference or their payment for order flow type broker, you're, you're effed. Um, I do think that some of the larger brokerages out there, and I do mean institutionalized brokerages, not discount brokerages, they do okay at being able to actually have the right number of shares because I've never once in my entire engagement with Fidelity had them even blink when I said I wanted to direct register something. It's instant. And yeah. by the way, GameStop was not the first thing I direct registered. I have, you know, um, my family, I've gotten some inheritance from a grandfather. And that was, in essence, doing the title transfer at Computer Share for Home Depot or wherever it was for Home Depot over to me. And so, like, this is not a new thing of you should own your own shares. If you're going to buy and hold for the long term and you're going to be a shareholder and not a trader, Right. It's not unusual. And I'll tell you that my dad was a stockbroker. My grandfather was an investor. They get direct registration on most of their holdings that they held for decades. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we had another question here. And real quick, uh, Fleetwood Mac and Cheese with the 279 Canadian. Appreciate the love, Ben. Uh, Fight uh, asks, uh, PP, can you ask him, in his opinion, where in the timeline of an acquisition, which is what we're all speculating about, does he personally think uh, we are at right now? Somewhere between 84 years and tomorrow. I agree, man. It's been a long time for sure, you know, but um, I can only assume that if it's taken this long that we're potentially dealing with a very, very large deal. Uh, and like you said, uh, you're you're speculating that Teddy is um, is the Amazon competitor itself. So, um, it would be safe to say something as large as this doesn't really get, um, you know, finished very quickly. It look, takes time. I, look, I, I could be really clear. I've worked in corporate America long enough and had to work with corporate counsels to create program documents and legal uh -huh. agreements and stuff like that. Yeah. There is zero chance, zero chance. Somebody walked in to a lawyer's office and said, I need you to write the terms of service for a children's book publishing company. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have all this stuff in it. And that person didn't look at them and go, the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So it's safe to say something obviously is going on. It's just as at this moment, it's non-public information. <laughs> like try to, you guys just try to imagine the characters from the office as corporate executives. Yeah. Now just imagine playing back any of these scenarios of we need to hire these data scientists and these behavioral programmers for a children's book company or a game distribution company. Right. Like none of the hires make any sense for what they're publicly stated as doing. Mm -hmm. None of the terms of service make any sense. Look at their tech stack and the things that to look at built with and the stuff that they're you know using. It's for like, like if they're not building an Amazon competitor, they're building the most overbuilt e-commerce site I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I mean it must be right because uh, again, there there's so much speculation between. Uh, you know, uh, Ryan Cohen comes in or first he writes the letter to the board. He comes on, he buys his stake. He sees the cash flows. He sees what's going on within the company. He's an insider at this point. Then he right. files additional trademarks for Teddy. Then he sells his shares four days later uh, and the stock proceeds to, to tank. So 
something here is is, is and it, it doesn't make sense because again his standstill ended March of this year, right? Yeah. So again, he's been there with the company, working with the company side by side, and he's listed in dockets. You, you know, it, it's hard to imagine that people actually believe that Ryan Cohen is, is not at all invested in, in this uh, stock or or planning to do something. Yeah. <laughs> but they also did buybacks, nuts, which man. put him over the ten percent. So I don't. I, that, that that's also might have been their way of trying to block him. I don't know who on the board wanted to block him, but they, they did buybacks at, when they had no reason to, which was what made him have to file. So one of the things that you begin to learn about boards uh, is they're full of well-intentioned people. When they see a hostile activist investor, their reaction typically isn't. Oh, goody, they're here to help, right? The, the reaction is somebody is going to force a change on us that we're not exactly aligned with. So I, I don't know that I would ascribe malevolence to incompetence often. And I, I think to a certain extent, there's a reasonable response from a board from an activist investor of wanting to try to trigger a protection or a poison pill just to buy yourself breathing room to say, well, let's figure out what we should do about this as opposed to having it happen to us. That's human nature, right? So I, I don't know if that's, you know, as much of malevolence. I think the stock buyback and taking debt on to do that was, mm -hmm. I mean, if that's not malfeasance, that's just complete incompetence. But that's one shareholder's point of view. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mo money with the two bucks. PP check subreddit bed bath voting documents are up. Really? Woo. Uh, we make it look easy with the two dollar Canadian says we love you, Ross. Right on. Hey, so Ross, uh, am I if I if most of my shares are actually on Robinhood, am I screwed? I'm not a financial advisor. I have no way of telling you that. <laughs> uh, so I mean, you what, said what, in, like, what you can do DT, is you see, like, what would that what would that even look like? You if, can transfer them to Fidelity. Ranking? Yeah, I don't know. I don't use Robinhood. <laughs> Thank you. For well, but like you said, you like if it really went to like a you know just if it was just like the biggest short squeeze that's happened, you know, you said the DTCC would like could break. Well, I, you like, got to think about who insures who, right? So every broker out there is backed by a bank, and they they trade on a collateral basis with those banks. I, mean, I feel like I'm reading the Big Short movie to you. Um, so the bank is who you basically get lending through to be able to finance and collateralize your trades. That bank is borrowing and lending money with the shares that are held at the DTC as collateral, and they're trading with the Fed, and they're trading you know, federal home loan bank loans and commercial back mortgages and doing reverse repo to manage cash and stuff like that. Well, at the end of the day, if a stock-based loan goes belly up, the person who has to provide the shares, like what I mean by belly up is, I can't afford to buy back the shares that have now gone to a thousand dollars. I got no money. They pull their pockets out and the moth flies out. Well, it's now up to the DTC to tax their member accounts to buy it back. So at some point it becomes, you need to get more money than exists. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what happens to the DTC at that point? Well, it begins dissolved. It gets owned by the Fed. The Fed owns everything at the end. And then, and then the Fed, you, like they would just come through and actually compensate, or look. Let's be clear. If we get to that point, we're going to be lucky to not have you know clubs and and bonfires outside. Well, that's what yeah. I'm thinking. I just be like, rioting like, everywhere. Just like yeah. I, 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 I kind of compare it to like the 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 Great Depression, and it was like you had all everything being bought on credit. And then it's like, oh, well, the, the gold wasn't actually backing. You know, the market was just a, you know, smoke. And Fugazi. Fugazi. Yeah, they're almost there. Now, now, let's just substitute gold with commercial backed mortgage securities and That's look at last. every major city that currently is sitting in class A office space at 40 percent unoccupied. Mm hmm. And all the collateral that's backing all these leveraged trades right now are those commercial backed loans that are worthless. Yeah. Right. So that, that I'm just like kind of worried. Like I'm like thinking like, well, what really like, you know, you said clubs and axes. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't know, like it, it would kind of devolve because it's like, Hey, who, who like every, the whole system that like that we trusted to put us in this position where right. everyone was just, let, let, let me get everybody off of the, the edge here for a second and just tell you like, human nature is not what you see in the movies. I mean, if you've ever, I, I grew up in South Florida. If you've been through a hurricane, you realize pretty quickly, most people are trying to help their neighbors out. Most people are trying to figure out how to make things work. So 
there's a basic notion in society, which is for it to really fall down that level, you have to have a basic breakdown in humanity. I don't see that coming for us in the US. Mm. That's just me. Yeah. But I do see One. you get into a situation where it's like, hey, why all of a sudden is the tax rate really high? And why all of a sudden is payroll tax really high? And why all of a sudden is the gas tax really high? It's because we're having to backstop a whole bunch of financial institutions. I think you're going to find too big to fail doesn't work this time. And let them fail becomes more of an argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, hey, PP, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to have to cut this short. I'm being right. someone to take care of some duties. Uh, Ross, thank you very much for coming on, answering everybody's sure. questions. You are a voice of reason and just highly intellectual about a lot of this. And uh, it, it was a privilege and an honor to sit in the same room with you. So, uh, I'm on the same subreddit all the time. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks again, PP, Michael, and ABC. If you're listening, y'all have a good night. Unfortunately, I got to cut it early. So. All right, no worries, man. Uh, have a good right. Uh, have a good night, Travis. All right, y'all too. All right, take care. So, as far as go. like, I'm gonna read a couple of these tips just real quick. Uh, hang on, just one second here. Uh, Apple Balls uh, says uh, transfer to Schwab. Jesus, Michael, mo money uh, with the five bucks. Michael, dude, just see what happened. Did you see what happened? to RH during the GME squeeze, RH is a potato brokerage. Uh, and then uh, Fleetwood Mac cheese with the 279, buying you a shot of whiskey, PP. Cheers. Right on, Fleetwood. Appreciate the fucking love, man. Um, all right. Uh, go ahead, Michael. Sorry to cut you off there. Well, I mean, I just, um, I know, I, I mean, I, I don't imagine it as much of just, you know, axes and, and, and people in the streets, but like, like I... I know I did a lot of research on Blue Apron and I, I just thought it was like undervalued and it had a short interest and and uh, so many weird so many things I, I didn't I didn't like happened. And uh, then the one day it did have an 80 percent run. I went to exercise my uh, I couldn't sell my my calls and uh, because they're like, oh, with a reverse split, like, oh, it didn't just adjust and, like you have to call in in person. And uh, they're like, yeah. And I was like, why? And they're like, oh, because we get people that like exercise them, you know, out of the money. And, and I'm like, I don't know. So like, then it went back down. I mean, I, I lost a lot of money all because, you know, the system was just rigged and it was just, I imagine something similar kind of happening. And like, what, what can I even do that, that they did that to me? And I just don't want that to happen with Bed Bath because it's going to be way, way, way bigger. I mean, you can transfer your your financial account to another brokerage if you choose to, Michael. Yeah. You know, you, you can transfer it. I mean, uh, you could you could pick any brokerage you want. I mean, me personally, I use Fidelity, so um, but you can easily transfer it and it takes like five days, man. So um if if you are that worried, I, I would just look into transferring to a brokerage and it just they just move your portfolio to there and then you your account's there. So Okay. Yeah. That's how it works. Um, you know, when I was really little, I, I bought my kids a little Tykes car, mm -hmm. you know, that little plastic one and stuff like that. And then when they turned 16, I got them a real car. Um, <laughs> you're still in the little Tykes brokerage account. <laughs> yeah. You're in like well, a little I, I didn't have car. Time. I mean, like <laughs> I went to like, like the thing is, is I, I finance wasn't like what I was at all thinking about. Like I actually have a biochemistry degree and I went to medical school. And then I didn't right. get into residency. And so I like, it was kind of, anyway, I like, it, it was like a weird journey that took me here. And so Robin Hood was so just I'm what I'm not going to give you crap over this, but you have a medical background. You installed the stock account version of WebMD. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Ross is calling you out there, man. <laughs> um, all right, cool. Uh, so I guess uh, um, we'll be wrapping up the show in about 20 minutes. Um, so we'll probably get into a little bit of docket stuff at the end of the night. Uh, Ross, is there anything else that you want to add? Or really, I should check with ABC or Michael. If there's anything else that you guys want to add while we still have Ross here. Uh, if not, uh, I'll have Ross give some closing thoughts on the stock uh, in general. But uh, let's hear it if you guys have some questions. I just want to say thank you, Michael. You're a gentleman and a scholar. It's a great addition Ross. to the show tonight. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love your words of wisdom. So thank you. Thanks, ABC. No, cool. same thing. I, I totally, I, I really do appreciate it because, you know, it gives legitimacy to someone that's actually an insider. I mean, like, we all can speculate about what we imagine uh, going on in, in boardrooms and whatnot, but like we, I mean, I for one don't know. So, cool.
guys trying to figure stuff out. That's all. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, cool. Well, Ross, man, uh, why don't you give us your closing thoughts to the people uh, tuning in at home? We have 835 people tuning in tonight. <laughs> uh, what would you like them to know, man? Uh, your thoughts about the company and some closing thoughts uh, as uh, uh, as we bring the show to a close. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about the stock. I'll just talk about the importance of community. Sure. I, I really like how supportive people have been of each other and just sort of helping folks understand, like, you know, there's a strong philosophy I have in my family that everybody shares a piece of the wisdom and that points of view are the biggest contributors to IQ, like sharing somebody else's perspective and understanding how they think about the problem or understand how they think about the opportunity. Everyone's coming at this from different levels of experience. And it's been really, really solid watching people grab newbies and help them along and figure out what's happening as well as debate the finer points of, you know, synthetic hedge, uh, and synthetic hypothecated, hypothecated positions and all that other stuff. So I just really appreciate the community and, and thank you guys for uh, a warm welcome. I appreciate it. Excellent. Uh, awesome, man. I got one last question. Is this your first time that you've been on the, or obviously you've been on the show your first time. Is, have you watched the show prior before oh, yeah. this? Okay. Yeah, I, it, but I keep it on, on a TV in my office while I'm doing other work on my computer. So it's playing in the background and I can listen to it. But right I, on in the chat and stuff like that. All right. So you're aware of how crazy the show can get sometimes. Good to know. Thank yeah. you for keeping it relatively. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, anything we can do, man. Um, all right. Well, you heard it from Ross, man. Chat, let's get some fucking love in the chat, man, for Ross. Uh, have a great rest of your night, man. And I uh, appreciate you uh, tuning in and coming on the show. Yeah, indeed. Talk to you later. See right. you. Take care. All right, wow. there you have it, guys. Uh, Ross, 